So I'm going to simplify things a little bit, and it's still going to be really complex. <laughs> um, so first of all, just some overview about um, where I'm going with this. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about where um, trade policy is actually made in the United States and internationally. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different agreements that uh, may or do affect um, water policy here in Maine. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples of some cases. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is an ongoing uh, negotiation that we could potentially affect um, where it goes, and a little bit about the Trade Commission here in Maine. Um, just very briefly, you know that we, under our Constitution, the state uh, has a role to play in regulating all kinds of things, including public health and the environment. And that is a dual role with the federal government. It's part of our constitutional system. Um, and, but when it comes to trade, trade is something that is negotiated by the President of the United States, delegated to the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. And those agreements are, are pretty much done by them. Uh, Congress can weigh in, uh, but uh, and must weigh in, in in terms of voting for it ultimately. But in the <coughs> past, we've had these sort of fast track things that have not allowed for a whole lot of amendment or, or any changes. So once it's a done deal by all the parties, it's it's a done deal. It's either an up or down vote, which is a very difficult thing uh, to to influence because your only choice is say throw out the whole agreement as opposed to fix it. So. Just a little bit more about the process. It is a secret process. Um, I am a cleared advisor. I'm one of only two state legislators in the country out of about six or 700 cleared advisors who are almost uniformly corporate attorneys. I get to see the text that the U.S. government is thinking of um, offering. I get to offer comments, which by and large I don't think they take into consideration, but sometimes they may. Um, and But I can't tell you what I saw, <laughs> and I can't share text with some real expert on the particular policy area that I've seen. I just do the best I can. Fortunately, I've been in the legislature 20 years and served on multiple committees, so I know a little bit about a lot of things. Um, so this is the list of who is mostly writing our trade policy, which are all these industry committees, and we're not talking about small businesses. These are, you know, the pharmaceutical industry and pharma. These are the tobacco <coughs> industry, these are the water industry, and every, everything else. And these are also other committees that are mostly industry. <laughs> so Maine has a Citizen Trade Commission. It's a great outfit. Um, they've done a lot of work educating the public about some of these issues. Uh, and they have done some work on water as well. And we have passed resolutions on trade policy. Um, so OK, getting into water. Um, there is a report that I think is really worth reading. Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to say comes from that, but with a little more detail. Um, it's on the web, and I'll give you the link at the end. Uh, but Maine has done a report uh, looking broadly at how water can be influenced um, by this. There's an alphabet soup of different agreements. You've all probably heard of NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. Then there's CAFTA, which is Central American. You've got two I get mixed up, the GAT and the GATS, okay? So like one involves goods and the other involves services. And these both may be involved in water policy. And then you have the TPP or the TPPA, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is what's being negotiated now among 11 countries that um, have like as much as a big toe in the uh, Pacific Ocean, but it could expand to any country. And we're talking, it could be the biggest trade agreement in the, in the world basically. Um, and then there's agreements between different countries, you know, just the two of us, Australia and the U.S., uh, the U.S. and Peru. That's a BIT. So there's a whole bunch of rules, and I'm going to kind of mix them up a little bit. Some of these may be in some of these agreements and not in others. Other of these provisions, you know, are, are in all of them. Um, but just to simplify things a little bit and give you an, an overall idea of kind of the scope of these trade agreements. They're no longer just about tariffs, okay? They're about actually getting involved in domestic regulations, state regulations, federal regulation. So here's some of the things that um, trade agreements can do. They can limit state-owned enterprises, and state here stands in for government. So we could be talking about municipal um, utilities. Um, they get involved in investment rules that give foreign um, investors or companies 
different rights, greater rights than domestic companies to go into private tribunals to sort out their complaints instead of the court system. They get involved in uh, takings. We've all talked about takings. We'll talk about some more. Um, has your property, the value, been taken for some purpose, some other purpose that you need to get compensated for? Um, they get involved in something called minimum standard of treatment, which is really a procedural fairness. Have you been treated fairly? Um, but it's especially used um, and when you change the rules. Uh, and then people feel it's unfair because first you were doing this, now you're doing that. You've changed the rules. Um, again, there's another rule, most favored nation. This is also about granting one advantage to one company but not to another. And again, it comes into the change in rules. And whether you, you know, first you weren't regulating water, now you are, could come into play. Then, of course, there's the standard limits on things like quotas and import and export duties. And then there's this uh, necessity test that came up in proposals that essentially you couldn't do regulations that were more burdensome than necessary. Again, a standard that we've talked about this sort of thing in the state of Maine. It's a very vague standard, a very dangerous standard. Okay, so here's some of the water rules that we might have here in the state of Maine that could be affected. And this isn't everything. Um, water extraction, water quality, environmental regulations that affect water quality or water quantity, like mining regulations. Um, whether something's publicly owned or you have to be willing to privatize. Um, procurement, what the state or the federal government or the municipalities might say, we want to only buy <coughs> water from this or we only want to do products that have these kinds of policies, that kind of thing. Okay, so here's quickly some of the agreements. The GATT, G-A-T-T, -T, regulates international trade in goods. Under the GATT, bottled water is clearly covered by this. It is considered a commodity. Um, it is definitely covered. Um, but there is a general exception that talks about if you're doing a regulation for the good of the public health or to preserve an exhaustible natural resource that something that otherwise would be prohibited may be allowed. And in general, the, um, you know, most of the legal research that I have looked at has said essentially that most rules in the state of Maine um, are still okay under this standard. But there is some concern that other kinds of rules dealing with bulk water, for example, might in fact be covered by the GATS in other ways. One of the things I, that we need to mention about this is th this is the WTO. You've probably heard about the WTO. You've heard about protests of the WTO. WTO has been like negotiated forever and it changes. So back you know, a couple years ago, there was a whole lot of negotiation going on, and there were proposals to do many things under the um, GATT um, that perhaps didn't actually ultimately happen. We still have an opportunity for the United States to say we want to cover water under the GATT as a general um, thing. That hasn't happened yet, but that is something that we need to pay attention to uh, because that is certainly something that could happen uh, in the future in terms of covering bulk water. Um, but in general, groundwater extraction does not appear to be covered by the GATT because it's not a product. Water bottles, product, okay? Then you have the GATS. It's confusing. Okay, GATS <coughs> is about services. What is a service? This is where you get into things like transportation, <coughs> distribution, um, anything could be a service, pipelines. Um, these are all services, providing water in a water utility. That's a service. So you can see that there's many areas where that kind of um, regulation of these kinds of things could um, affect um, water. And again, this is an area where um, we don't know whether or not the U.S. would ever commit to this. Um, the World Trade Organization says, no, we're not actually doing this in terms of covering um, water. Uh, water is not covered by this particular agreement, but there was a major push by the European Union to cover water um, not very many years ago, and because these agreements are done in secret, the negotiations of them, we often don't know what really is going on behind the scenes. So this is something that we need to pay attention to, because these negotiations continue and more and more countries join in um, to this um, negotiation. Right now there's like <coughs> 150 plus countries. So if 
um, the GATS were to cover water, and I mentioned the TPPA, or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which has provisions on all kinds of stuff, what would that mean? Um, I went to the website to just look at how many water um, districts we had, and I could not count them. I just went to, I clicked, you, this is an interactive map on the web, and I clicked on the Rustic County, and there was about 10 pages, <laughs> including like campground water districts and everything like that. Um, well, so we have a lot of water districts. What would this mean potentially? This is where we just heard talk about the privatization. This is where um, some of the rules, if they were to cover uh, water districts, would require municipalities to consider privatizing, for example, um, and opening it up. They might prohibit a, mon a monopoly, uh, which is, you know, your local water district says you have to get it from us unless you drill your own well kind of thing. Um, it might prohibit um, different kinds of regulations. Uh, that you could have through the PUC um, or in terms of water quality. And I guess one of the biggest uh, areas where it's been a, a problem in the um, agreements that have covered water districts, and you, there's all kinds of cases out there suing Argentina, suing Bolivia, um, is when uh, in a country or an area or a municipality decides we are going to you know, hire this private company to provide water in our uh, area. And then they find out, oh my God, this private company has no rules attached and they have quadrupled, they've, they've increased the water prices by 400%, let's say. This is a Bolivian case. Um, we don't want to do that anymore. We're going to go back to the way it was before because that actually turns out was working pretty well. Then you have this, all these rules kick in that say, oh no, 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 you know, you are not treating this company fairly. You are expropriating their um, property. You can't do that. And so all these other rules come into play. And so that has been where, uh, in places where these kinds of rules have been in effect, it's been a very um, bad situation um, for those um, communities and countries. Uh, and so under NAFTA, we all have heard about NAFTA, I think. NAFTA has a provision. It's called um, ch Chapter 11 or the Annex that um, actually allows for these investor um, lawsuits. And this is also a matter in the TPPA. Um, this goes to expropriation. This is the actual language from NAFTA. It talks about not only taking the property physically, like the, the highway going across your property, they're taking it, they have to compensate you, um, but it also talks about doing things that are regulatory matters that in fact are equivalent to um, taking your property. So the language is any measure or measures having the equivalent effect as taking your property. Okay? So this is a right that NAFTA gives to investors, private companies, um, to go and get compensated for actions that the state might take um, relating to different things. This has actually been used in Canada as a claim in a water case. And this is a case that was settled. This is not a groundwater case, but it's an important case because it deals with the water permit. And the issue here is that this company, and Bowwater used to be in the state of Maine, it's now, I, I don't know what Abitie Bowwater is, but they closed a pulp and paper mill and they had all these permits for water use. And so they wanted to sell not only the mill, but also all the permits they have and get money for the permits. And the Newfoundland government said, no, 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 we gave you all these, you know, things to get the plant going and then you reneged on it, you didn't do your part of the bargain, we want the plant and not only that but you don't have the right to sell that permit, that's not property, that's an environmental permit. And unfortunately the country of Canada settled this claim and by means of settling it they've sort of validated the claim of the company that in fact that water permit was worth something. Now we're talking about groundwater here, this is surface water, but it's the same principle. If you have a permit to um, do something with water to get some value out of it, and then you decide, well, I've had it with the state of Maine, I'm going somewhere else, but we're going to sell it to the highest bidder, um, you could be sued under this provision of NAFTA. And when I say you, it's basically the U.S. government would be sued. They're representing us, the state of Maine, um, we don't have any role in that, and it takes place in a private tribunal, not in a court system, based on rules set forth in the treaty, not in um, our court system.
So I told you I was going to run out of time. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership has these same provisions in it, and it's actually worse than NAFTA. We know this. I can tell you about this because somebody thought this text was so terrible that they publicly leaked it, and it's on a public website. And now these very smart law professors uh, have been able to analyze it and say, oh my god, it's worse than NAFTA. It's worse than NAFTA because it actually defines um, what is an investment so broadly that you, you know, don't need to do much more than think about creating something in the state of Maine, let's say, um, and then it would be covered by this provision. And it's also worse than NAFTA because if there's so many countries that are involved in it, um, that there's many more countries that could be bringing cases against the country, or it could be a subsidiary even of a U.S. company based in one of these foreign countries. So I have several slides about why the TPPA is worse than NAFTA. Um, and so just to kind of, uh, I know I don't, I'm running out of time, but. Sharon, I'll, I'll trade you my five minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so here, here's what is really a big problem with all of this. And, you know, I, I listed off all those different standards. Unfortunately, these are not claims that are brought to our court system and that are decided based on the U.S. Constitution. They are decided based on trade law in a private tribunal with trade lawyers being the ones who are making the decisions, who one day are representing Nestle and the next day are in, you know, this, this tribunal where they're acting as the judge. Okay? And that is a concern. And it's also a concern that we are making decisions here in Maine about should we pass a takings law? If we do, should it be 50% or 80%? Or should we stick with the constitutional standard, which is that most of the value of what you invested has to be taken before you can get compensation? We've made a decision on that twice, okay? And we have rejected it. We've rejected cost-benefit analyses. Um, yet these trade agreements stick that stuff right back into a trade agreement, and it's decided in a form where we're not represented not based on the constitutional standard in the U.S. Constitution or the Maine Constitution, but based on what is in NAFTA or the TPPA. And that is very different. It's a weaker standard. Um, our Citizen Trade Policy Commission has written on this issue and weighed in on it uh, in opposition to it and has taken a position, again, this is in this report that I mentioned at the, big, at the beginning, Water should just be carved out of these trade agreements. It's a human right. We're going to hear about that later today. This is about the survival of people and, you know, really our planet. And it should not be something that is subject to a treaty or a trade agreement. And that is the bottom line. So that's why it matters. And here's my information, and I can make a PowerPoint available. But if you do... Um, do Facebook, I post an awful lot of stuff about trade on my Facebook page. Pretty much that's about half of what I put up there. So if you're interested in this subject, log on to that and um, you'll learn all kinds of stuff. Okay.